one of the key aspects we look at in the smart agriculture is the financial empowerment, the connectivity and the skilled. So definitely the skilled and the, and the connectivity are not yet digitalized in the blocks and chain. So, and those who touch in those areas that you mentioned around the early, the process, the pre-harvest process, that's where those two aspects come in. Certainly, um, you know, with ideas from startups, uh, because that's one of the things that we try to look at to say, how do we work with startups in the country to, to, to connect and, and, and partner on different ideas? So it's worth exploring. We've never thought about it, but it will be really worth exploring, to be honest. And I think it provides an exp exciting space to, to look at. Yeah, certainly worth considering. Thanks. Like Yumanda said, this is a week. So Indeed. have the conversations. <laughs> Let's see how many. You know, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, so are there any more questions from the audience before I shift? Uh, so on the online side of things, uh, don't worry, I'll pick up the questions for you. Uh, Jeff, I think this one's going to go to you. What if there's an error in the first block generated? How easy is that to fix? Especially if that error, I imagine, starts to perpetuate without any more So for the Genesis block, it's mostly generated by the kernel itself. So it's not that the Genesis block doesn't have any human intervention because the Genesis block is the one which identifies the authenticity of the whole chain. It, this means that each block is connected by a specific um, hash function. Just, that's, that's the only technical term I'll use. <laughs> but um, each, so each block is pegged to another block, but the Genesis block, since it has no human intervention, it makes sure that it makes, it makes sure that the whole chain is authentic. So the Genesis block is generated by the first deployment. Then as you continue migrating smart contracts, it continues to generate blocks pegged to the Genesis block. Yes. The Genesis block cannot have it. But the, the, the next blocks, if you migrate the smart contracts strongly, or maybe you might have made some mixed up um, uh, logic on your smart contract logic, then it might generate a block wrongly. But then again, it can patch the whole chain. But if you patch the whole chain, the next new chain, the Genesis block again is generated automatically. So it still retains the authenticity of the chain. The block code is generated. That's the part that scared me, right? So a little human interaction. My name is this, the weight is this, uh, my phone number is this. Next day, oh my goodness, I did it wrong. That's the part. And there was that little moment, block code generated. So you're saying that's not actually the Genesis code? No. The Genesis block is like, uh, the schema, the schema of the whole chain. So it's the way you have a database as a schema. It shows like how the whole database um, architecture is laid out. Then you can create like a, a, a DB, and then you can migrate like, tables within the database, which is pegged again the logic of the scheme. So so when 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 let's say they manipulate using the front end, it's connected with smart contracts, which again when they executed. And then goes through a layer of the cryptography, and then is written on the blockchain network. It's back to the Genesis block. So it's that's not that's not the Genesis. No, block. so I'm a director of operations. So I want to know: Can I correct human error? Yes. Or whether the weak point is when it's created. So I mean, there's you know there's a weak point. The, the beauty of blockchain is that everybody can validate the transaction, except at the beginning. And then if I have the ability to correct an error at the beginning, I have a weak point. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. Yeah, um, you can be able to modify because remember you just, for, for, for example, for the application, you're using the front, end, uh, the front user interface. So it means if let's say you create a KYC um, login uh, into the database, you're migrating a smart contract, which creates a block that is connected to the Genesis block. So the Genesis block, you won't, you won't interact with it. It's, 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 it's like hidden files in your computer. So the, the whole thing is if somebody messes up, 
the, the stakeholders and everyone who is um, well acquainted with the chain will be able to see. And if you make another correction, let's say you edit on the user interface, and then you press submit, it migrates other smart contracts, which will now create a block back to the other block, but the true state will be the new block which has the correction. But let's say if we are talking about, um, let's say hacking or something that happened within the chain, that the consensus of the guy is governing the, the, the network feel that um, it might harm the data. They can patch the whole chain because it's again replicated, a copy is stored in a node. There's a self-healing mechanism that a whole new chain takes the place of the patch chain. So it's like nothing ever happened. If there was a mistake or something, we'd white it out. No one would see what was there before and then we'd write on top of it. In this case, is the equivalent of just crossing it through with a pen. Everyone can still see what was originally there and just writing the new one next to it. That's how it, it, it makes sense in my head. Um, Alvin, you have my password. Just uh, unlock it, please. Okay, that was a lot of technical stuff. Let's see if there's non-technical. This should be an easy one. Will the training uh, held by ABC focus on only the Cardano blockchain? Now, we are mostly focused on creating capacity for Africa. We, we don't want companies in various countries in Africa to keep on um, uh, importing uh, talent, but to utilize the people they have, because we actually have smart Africans. So the thought process is, um, let's say you work in ABC. Um, we normally teach a baseline protocol, which is Ethereum. And then we teach uh, three more protocols, which is Cardano. The reason is because it has a different programming style. Uh, it's more or less functional programming. Um, even how the compilers compile the smart contracts is purely different. But we think that using that protocol, you can create really smart solutions in regards to even identity management and how you can manipulate the chains. And even you can even go granular and manipulate a single block. Um, we teach Algorand, which is more or less built on, uh, it has a fusion with Ethereum. And we teach um, Solana, because you're also looking around Solana. So the idea is we teach you the concepts, and then we teach you a baseline protocol, and then you can explore other protocols. Because if you think about it, how you build solutions on blockchain technology, more or less fall in line with a specific style. Now, if I teach you one style in regards to how you build the solution, then you even migrate into another protocol, won't be a burden. How, how do we avoid a vendor lock-in? because both of you are on a specific blockchain provider. Um, Cardano, they've, uh, sorry, Adanian Labs have talked about teaching multiple protocols, but in your case with an application you're deploying, you're specifically tied to certain technologies. Is there, how do you plan on avoiding, especially considering that the data is now stored along that entire blockchain? It's, uh, it's too technical. Like I said, we okay. just piloted, to be honest, we haven't really explored that much mm -hmm. in terms of how it actually works. Uh, we're still learning. Uh, I wouldn't have an answer for that, unfortunately. Maybe next year, you can ask me all those technical We'll look questions. forward to it. <laughs> yes, it can be avoided. Now, first of all, how do we understand vendor lock -in? That we are stuck to a particular provider and we can't move. Yeah, yeah it's basically you're stuck to a particular provider you can't move. But then again, if it means that the specific consensus, the one, is, of course, there's a body that governs the network. Now, if the body agrees that we stick to a specific vendor for the sake of the clients of the application, then they have the best um, interest of the people at hand, and that's the best decision at that point. But the consensus are the ones who actually oversee whether they needs to be a vendor lock or not. If not, then you, you can be able again to use or have multiple vendors to provide the solutions. So just to answer you, yes, you can avoid it because remember, it's built on trust. Um, it's around what Jeff was even talking about, the mindset, the uh, interest in the technology itself. So 
as you guys are piloting and talking to port authorities and such, um, what has been the experience when it comes to blockchain? As in, uh, is it a positive first experience, a negative one? And for those that have been more on the apprehensive negative side, that, oh, this is voodoo, magic stuff, how, how do you um, approach that mindset? Um, for us, I think working with, with these farmers, just selling the idea to them and the simplification process, um, it wasn't as hard as <laughs> one would have imagined in the sense of men or speaking, because um, this, the way we sell the idea is the simplification process, because they understand the, pro the, the challenges that they have currently in terms of between payment and taking the the goods to to the to the aggregator and the whole process is very cumbersome to be honest so when we propose this idea to them to so like this simplifies this it's an idea that most farmers are actually very open-minded i suppose maybe it's the fact that farmers are just very um they don't think they not think per se but they don't have a lot of um they like to try new things and they always like to try to innovate as much as um the, the, where they are in those rural communities so no the challenges were not there in that sense because of their their level of actually accepting to try these new te technologies and the simplification process uh, from a regulatory perspective not so many um as well uh, as i mentioned the government itself is actually approached to say can you really teach us how this technology works how blockchain works we're really interested to know how does it actually help um, and how can we scale it to other uh, areas so yeah. It, we, we've seen that it's quite positive. We haven't had any negative or regulatory issues that has come with the, with the introduction of this. Yeah. That, that's amazing to hear. It might change my mindset. So I have a mindset that if we are implementing some fancy technology most people don't understand, let's not tell them about it. <laughs> if they don't have to interact with it, yeah. then they don't need to know about it. Because if we are about to explain what a blockchain is or what AI is, it can cause more problems sometimes. Mm -hmm. But if that's the case, then that's really great to hear. No bad news is, is, is great. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, yeah, I think, yeah. I, uh, to be honest, the, the COVID crisis has somehow changed the way the government sees technology. Yeah. It's no longer seeing the technology as an enemy. Not that I'm, I work for the government or anything, but we're seeing more and more of that when we deal in these government spaces. It's a really change of mindset that we're seeing. And I think as, as us, as providers of these technologies, we should not go with the mindset of, oh, I'm going to shove it down your throats. Mm -hmm. We should go with the mindset of, can I teach you, you understand, and then you can provide me with the support that I need. Agreed. So going with that teaching mentality really changes your dialogue. Um, so I think it's that perspective changes the, the, the entire um, uh, sector, you know, that's great yeah that's, that's that's the advice i give out and how has it been on the port authority side well it's um for me it's not as important as uh, uh, only mm. it's goes way beyond that because it's port it's tra it's tasak um the the bot as well so when we've gone to all those places yeah and um in most cases when uh, we present our case understood well and uh, they're much more eager for that to be implemented but the thing is it's going to goes beyond their capacity to decide because it, it, it involves the the country directions for instance when you go to port um they have developed their internal systems just to fix the problems and they invested heavily mm -hmm. so now you're telling them we have a solution for you uh, which you can really adapt and start moving. So it's like, uh, okay, maybe hold on. We have our own internal issues. We try to see if they work. If it doesn't work according to our expectations, then maybe we can consider yours. But uh, it's a kind of tricky. So we still, uh, I believe for, for us, we still have a long way to go. But uh, if the high authority may intervene and uh, see this through, because um, from what it is, this is like uh, something which is inevitable. Because it's it's like you're trying to avoid uh, using Swift, no matter how good system you build. But once you want to go globally, there's no way you can avoid Swift code. It's there to stay, unless there's always something else come which is better than that. Uh, for the meantime, Trojans is better than any 
available system <laughs> at the moment. So I believe it's just a matter of time. Once they realize it, then I think we can move. We're, we're still trying to push and uh, telling them how good it is and how maybe because it's not only Tanzania, it's globally. So if once you see there's a lot of port global, but only around uh, 20% that have already agreed and the rest is are still at the lobbying stages and trying to see and uh, how well best they can incorporate or incorporate the system into their own internal system and how they can leverage it from that. So I believe it's just a matter of time, in few, maybe a few months to come, maybe they can see the real value of it and uh, they can adapt the system. So on Wednesday, Jeff will be at Sahara Sparks. We have our CTO, Mr. Bendon Murgo. Bendon, can you please stand up? <laughs> Who will also be leading one of the most amazing technical software engineers I have ever met. And it's not like I've met many, but he's profound. <laughs> and then we have Raymond also from Adenian Labs, our head of technology, another very amazing software engineer. We have Natasha, who is leading the AI Center of Excellence. So we're truly planning to um, share and uh, learn and um, showcase, hire, hire and uh, incubate the whole shebang so we're looking forward to um the wednesday session thank you so much yeah. they'll be doing a lot of things there and there's also one question about minimum qualification to get involved this will be answered. everything's on the wednesday yes paul technical question thank you yeah so uh <laughs> my question is uh so it goes to uh, Daniel Labs. So uh, as you planning to build skills and capacity around blockchain, my question is, how are you planning to create a pipeline of demand and supply? Because if, uh, I, 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 I assume you have already have a plan because I, I think it's critical to plan that because we may end up falling into the trends like the BCom trend, the telecom trend, where again, then people just follow the, follow the trend without a clear plan. So I just wanted to learn about your plan for demand and supply for the skills that you created. Thank you. And uh, we, we actually are very firm believers of not training for the sake of training. What is the value that, or the outcome that we want to get out of the trained people, the trained pool? A, we are building 300 plus companies as Adanian Labs. So we will pretty much absorb a huge part of the people that we train be just on day one, or is it day zero for us? One of our partners, Emugo Africa, next um, Chimia Consulting, these are global blockchain companies that spend a lot of money building blockchain solutions in Asia. And now with this partnership and with these training programs, they will be outsourcing uh, solutions and programming in Africa. And uh, we also want, that's why we say we want to also train business leaders so that we create that demand. As we're training the programmers, we're also instigating demand through industries, you know, talking to banks. We're so happy to see Tanzania breweries um, leading um, such innovations because that's the demand that will be needed. How do we get that solution built locally and not being outsourced? You know, so we're doing all of these things and we're building a portal for specialized tech um, tech uh, skills, you know, and this portal will be global, you know, so you, can, you could be in Tanga, Iringa, and working for a big company wherever in the world, in Australia. So that is the vision that we have. And we want this to happen now. Um, in Kenya, last year, was it this year, when we finished the AI data scientist training, it was 35 um, trainees. Uh, we took, I think, one third of them in-house and the remaining bit were hired by banks, telecom. Before we knew it, everybody was already taken. So there is a huge gap for specialized smart tech um, skills and we are here to solve all of that. <laughs>